Thank you, Dr. Feliciano. I am so incredibly humbled and honored today to be giving the Roger T. Sherman Lecture at this year's 85th Southeastern Surgical Congress. Dr. Feliciano, when I received your letter a little over one year ago on January 20th, I thought how incredibly special to have received this invitation from you. You have made me the trauma surgeon I am today, whether it was trying to memorize your textbook, impress you as a visiting professor, or seek your advice on how to be a chief. I did not have the pleasure of meeting or knowing Dr. Sherman, but no doubt through knowing you, I have come to know him. I asked Dr. Sylvia Campbell, with whom Dr. Sherman mentored, to share her thoughts with me, and I would like to share them with you today. Quote, there are times in life when one encounters another individual whose impact is so great that it changes you forever, molding you into something more than you believed you could become. There are times in life when you encounter someone whose lessons continue on long after they have left you, and you hear their words and know the meaning throughout your life, not only in your career, but in each aspect of your life. Dr. Sherman was such a man a surgeon's surgeon. His talent and skill were unsurpassed. But more than that, his compassion and care for patients were the most valuable lessons that he shared. He truly believed in the art of medicine, which is much greater than the words one can learn from a book. And he shared his art. He demanded much from those who worked under him, just as he demanded much from himself. Yet in so doing, he made you more. He was never belittling, he was always encouraging, and his love of medicine, his love of surgery was contagious. It was such an honor and privilege to know him, to work for him, and to call him my mentor." Unquote. All of us have had mentors like Dr. Sherman, who have guided us to where we are today, and we surely hope to be the mentor that he was. As Dr. Feliciano told us yesterday, Trauma is the leading cause of death in people 40 years of age and under. In 2016, there were 277 Philadelphians who were murdered. Just since January of 2017, we've had 48 murders, an increase of 38% from where we were last year. Most homicides were from shootings or stabbings. The case that I'm about to describe is probably no different or no dissimilar to many of the cases that occur in your trauma centers all over this country. The patient is a 20-year-old male. He arrived at Temple University Hospital at 1641 on March 12, 2013. He had a gunshot wound to the left and right flank. He had agonal respirations and a carotid pulse only. We did rapid sequence intubation, placed a right peripheral line and a left subclavian vein cordis, we started transfusing uncrossed matched blood and intravenous fluids. The MTP, our massive transfusion protocol, was activated. We did a very quick chest x-ray and KUB and took him to the operating room. At exploration, he was found to have an infrarenal aorta injury as well as an infrarenal IVC injury. His IVC was ligated a number 28 French chest tube was placed as a shunt into the aorta. He had a right nephrectomy, a segmental right hemicolectomy. His duodenum was primarily repaired. And I'm sorry to say he did have a modified back placed after his abdomen was packed. And he had bilateral four compartment fasciotomy. This is just a picture on the left, is the aortic injury with the chest tube inside. And on the right is the aortic homograph that we replaced the aortic injury with about 36 hours after we had taken him back to the operating room. During the operation, the index operation, he received 60 units of packed red blood cells, 45 units of fresh frozen plasma, five pools of platelets, four liters of crystalloid, he had an estimated blood loss of 19 liters, and he made 450 cc's of urine. Now the question is, why did this patient live? 
Was it the surgeons? Well, I'm sure as surgeons and the surgeons in the operating room that day were exceedingly skilled, but I surely don't believe that it was just the surgeons that saved this man's life. Was it our anesthesiologists? Now, they were absolutely tremendous that day. They transfused about over 100 units of blood products, really kept up with the blood loss, and did not flood him with a lot of crystalloid resuscitation. Was it the blood bank and our massive transfusion protocol? Our blood, blank our blood bank worked furiously that day, as they do on many days and many nights at Temple. Now, was it God? Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you it wasn't God, because the one thing that I've learned as a trauma surgeon uh, in North Philadelphia for the past 25 years is that there is no doubt um, that God has so much to do with what we do, and I have truly become a God-fearing trauma surgeon. But I truly believe that what saved this patient's life was his immediate transport to the hospital from the scene. So when do we decide as surgeons to change practice? We change practice when the scientific evidence tells us to. Sometimes we change practice when technology changes. And we also change practice when we realize that we could do so much better than what we're doing now. Now in trauma, scientific evidence and technology really do go hand in hand. And we've had a considerable change to our workup in transmediastinal gunshot wounds, gunshot wounds of the neck, and proximity extremity gunshot wounds because of CTA. And the literature has supported that. But we change practice when we think that we can do so much better. And what we've been doing with our trauma patients is applying ACLS principles to the care of our penetrating trauma population. And I would say after 25 years in North Philadelphia, I am truly tired of seeing young men die. And it's, time, it, and it's time we change our practice. I don't know if there are many uh, MASH fans out there in the audience, but I was a very significant MASH fan growing up. And I specifically remember a conversation that Hawkeye uh, had with uh, Colonel Blake after a very, very busy night in the operating room. And Hawkeye was very discouraged. And Colonel Blake said to him, there are certain rules about a war. And rule number one is young men die. And rule number two is doctors can't change rule number one. But as trauma surgeons, we do change number one. And we can change number one even more than we already do. So in our case, I really do believe that it was the immediate transport to Temple that saved this patient's life. Now why immediate transport? Is it the time at the scene? In a city like Philadelphia, where we have five level one trauma centers, I really don't think it's the time at the scene at all. In fact, I think it's the time that, it, that the time is irrelevant. It's the procedures themselves that we're performing in the field that are very detrimental to our penetrating trauma patient. Now, this is not a new concept. In fact, it's an old concept, and we've kind of lost our way a little bit. Cannon published in JAMA in 1918, injection of a fluid that will increase pressure has dangers in itself. Hemorrhage, in the case of shock, may not have occurred to a marked degree because blood pressure has been too low and flow too scant to overcome a clot. If the pressure is raised before the surgeon is ready to check any bleeding that may take place, blood that is sorely needed may be lost. The Office of the Surgeon General published during World War II the same concept. When internal hemorrhage persisted, there could be no resuscitation without surgery. The blood or plasma merely leaked into the traumatized regions. Surgery with control of the hemorrhage was the simplest and most effective way of accomplishing full resuscitation. So where did we go? How did we get to the point that ATLS said, let's give two liters of fluid in our trauma bays and giving fluid out in the field? Because surely a patient that comes in like this with injuries to either the aorta or the cava, that we put a femoral cortis in, that we hook it up to our level one transfuser and start infusing blood and crystalloid at very high pressures, this cannot be good for our patients. So how did we actually get to giving intravenous fluids. Well, actually, it was the Shires and Dillon shock model 
uh, that was really a modification of the Wigger's old shock model. And what they did was they had an exsanguination to shock in a very controlled fashion. And they would take dogs and they would place a femoral artery catheter and they would exsanguinate the animal. After the hemorrhage stopped, after about two hours of hypotension, they would stop the, turn the stopcock, and then resuscitation with crystalloid and blood started after the hemorrhage was stopped. The canine outcomes were then measured by the resuscitation fluid that they had received. And Shires published his data in the Archives of Surgery in 1964. And he said that the restoration of the functional extracellular fluid volume with lactated ringers, in addition to blood, reduced the mortality in these canines from 80%, which had been previously seen, to 30% in that study. And they became proponents, as did all of we, of aggressive fluid resuscitation, specifically crystalloid, to replenish the fluid in the interstitial space. But then came along a new animal shock model, something that actually made more sense because the hemorrhage didn't take all that time. And then actually the hemorrhage and the resuscitation would occur at the same time, and the hemorrhage would not always be controlled. So the new animal shock model had the exsanguination to shock in a controlled fashion, as did Dillon and, Sh and Shires uh, via a catheter in the femoral artery. But they also developed an uncontrolled hemorrhage uh, by making an aortic vascular injury, and I'll describe that in a bit. And then, of course, the resuscitation occurred as the hemorrhage continued. And then in all of these studies, they looked at the relationship between the resuscitation and the ongoing hemorrhage. So in the new shock models, they would place catheters in the femoral artery for blood pressure monitoring for controlled exsanguination. They would also place a catheter in the femoral vein to give intravenous fluids, to give blood, to give medications, to check any blood labs. And they would also have this uncontrolled injury to the aorta. And what they would do is they would suture in two wires in the distal portion of the aorta. They would exteriorize those wires and then pull them. And that was their uncontrolled hemorrhagic model. Now, there were probably about 20 or 30 studies that were published during this time period, and all of them varied with the type of animal that was, uh, that was being used, the amount of hemorrhage, whether it was lethal or non-lethal, the volume of the resuscitation, the type of the resuscitation fluid, and the parameters measured. But all of those studies showed that those animals that had a delayed resuscitation or permissive, hypoten permissive hypotension or hypotensive resuscitation, those animals had a greater survival rate. And it was all of those studies that led to the landmark article that all of us are very familiar with that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1994, out of Houston, Texas, and the Maddox Group. It was a prospective randomized trial that looked at hypotensive victims with penetrating truncal injury. There were about 600 patients with a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. Group one had an immediate resuscitation on the even days, and group two had a delayed resuscitation on the odd days, not perfectly randomized, but randomized, but not perfectly. When they looked at survival to discharge, what was the survival to discharge on those patients and compared delayed to immediate, the delayed group had a higher survival at 70%. And this was statistically significant. And this did change our practice. And finally, we saw this in our ATLS um, manuals. Now, when Seaman was at Temple, he wanted to look at interventions themselves. So we looked at the interventions that were done by BLS and ALS. We did a prospective observational cohort study of penetrating trauma patients brought to Temple by EMS. We looked at patients from June 2008 to December 2009. And what we sought to measure were hospital survival, pre-hospital procedures, and pre-hospital times. There are about 1,100 penetrating trauma victims that were taken care of during that time period. But we had to exclude a significant number. We excluded about 500 for minor injuries and about 16 patients for absent signs of life because it wasn't this patient population that we thought 
would benefit from the immediate transport and the lack of intravenous fluids or the lack of procedures in the field. We had to exclude 304 patients that were transpa transported by either police, private vehicle, or walk-in because we were unable to get the data that we were looking for, hospital survival, well, really pre-hospital procedures and pre-hospital times. We also had to exclude penetrating mechanism other than gunshot wound or stab wound. That left us with 236 patients, 71% that were transported by ALS, and 29% that were transported by BLS. The two groups were comparable with regard to age, mechanism, seen glass glaucoma score, ISS, or need for emergency surgery. When you looked at pre-hospital interventions, it was no surprise that the ALS group, 97% of the time, had an intervention uh, performed and that BLS only 17% of the time, and of course that was statistically significant. When you looked at on-scene time, again, not surprised that the ALS group had a longer on-scene time at 9.4 minutes versus 7.7 .7 minutes in the BLS group, and that was statistically significant. But when you looked at the total pre-hospital time, the time from when the dispatcher received the call till the time that the patient arrived at our trauma center, the time between the ALS group and the BLS group were no different. And that was uh, not statistically significant, as you see. Now, when you look at survival, survival of the BLS versus the ALS group, and survival on the y-axis here, on the BLS group, the patients had a survival of 88.4% of the time, and the ALS group had a survival of 69.5% of the time, statistically significant. When you look at whether the patient had a procedure or not, yes or no, those patients that had no procedures survived 87.1% of the time, and those patients that had, uh, that had procedures performed survived 70.7% .7 of the time, and again, statistically significant. So we've looked at fluid, we've looked at, um, at intubation, I'm sorry, we've looked at fluid, we've looked at procedures, now let's look at intubation. Again, uh, out of Temple, Sharvan Tagavi, who's going to be starting his uh, trauma fellowship at the Brigham in July, did a chart review at Temple of 1,615 penetrating trauma patients over a five-year period from 2006 to 2010. 152 patients, or nearly 10% of the patients, were intubated in the field. And when we looked at outcomes, we saw that pre-hospital intubation was actually associated with an increased mortality. And pre-hospital intubation was not protective against pulmonary complications, DVT or PE, sepsis, wound infections, or any other complication. And we concluded from that study that the immediate transport by EMS personnel may result in improved outcomes. Uh, Rappold, while he was at Temple, also did a study comparing BLS and ALS survivorship as well. It was a retrospective study, 2008 now to 2013. He looked at all penetrating trauma patients that were transported to Temple. We looked at penetrating trauma patient survival and mode of transport, and we looked at penetrating trauma patient survival and the type of EMS care that was provided, whether that was ALS care or BLS care. What we found was there were 1,490 patients with penetrating trauma that were transported to Temple during that time period. 45% were transported by ALS, 40% by police, and 15% by BLS. There was a 3.71-fold increase in the odds of death among patients that were treated and transported by ALS compared to the BLS transported and treated patients. So the question is, why no change in practice? Now this is just a small sampling of our temple papers, but all of us as trauma surgeons that are familiar with the literature know that there is so much in the literature, whether it's intravenous fluids or intubation, that doesn't support what's going on in the field in our, in our big cities. So I thought, okay, let's go back to the lab. Let's do our own 
uh, animal model of exsanguination and shock. So we did. Our goal was to, cre to create a translational large animal model that simulates hemorrhagic shock caused by penetrating trauma. And what we wanted to do was test the idea of permissive hypoventilation, where manual breaths are not given and 100% oxygen is, is administered passively via a face mask or a nose cone. Our hypothesis was that in severe low flow states, positive pressure ventilation would have harmful physiologic effects and that permissive hypoventilation would result in better outcomes. We used Yorkshire swine weighing about 30 kilograms. We started the animals on a propofol drip and we had three groups of different animals. We had an intubation and manual ventilation group, a bag valve mask ventilation and, and ambu bag group, and a permissive hypoventilation with a face mask and a nose cone group. We placed a swan dance catheter through a central venous introducer. We also placed a femoral arterial line and a 14 gauge catheter with a stopcock in the carotid artery was used for exsanguination. We got baseline arterial blood gas measurements as well as laboratory values and different hemodynamic parameters. We then opened the stopcock and exsanguinated the animal. We then took hemodynamic and laboratory values were then measured every 10 minutes. Our primary outcome was time until death and our secondary outcome were hemodynamic parameters such as cardiac output and central venous pressure, metabolic values such as pH, lactic acid, uh, lactic acid and oxygen levels, and end organ damage such as creatinine. When you look at survival, so on the x-axis is minutes, on the uh, y-axis is percent of survival, and all of these graphs coming up, face mask will be in black, bag valve mask animals will be in blue, and the intubated animal will be in red. And there was no survival benefit at all for the intubated animal. Let's look at the thermoregulation and the hemodynamics. The body temperature in the face mask animals when compared to the intubated and bag valve mask animals were statistically significantly greater, the temperature was higher across all time points. And we know that a higher temperature for these patients or for the animals or for our patients uh, will surely help us with clotting and preventing a coagulopathy. When we looked at systolic blood pressure, again systolic blood pressure on the Y, time on the X, the systolic blood pressure was greater when compared to the, intima the intubated group at all time points and that was, that was statistically significantly greater. When we looked at CVP or central venous pressure, in the early phases of shock, we did see in the face mask or in the nose cone animals, they did have a statistically significant higher CVP. When we looked at cardiac output, again, cardiac output on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, uh, the face mask group, when compared to the intubated and the bag, valve, the bag valve mask group across all time points, had a statistically significantly higher cardiac output than the bag valve mask group and the intubated group. We'll look at acid-base status and gas exchange. pH. The pH was higher in the intubated and the, bag, and the bag valve mass group, and that, again, was statistically significant across all the time points. A higher pH not being very good because of uh, what it does to the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. When you're looking at carbon dioxide, again, not a surprise that in the face mass group, carbon dioxide would be higher, that this would be statistically significant compared to the bag valve mask and the intubated group across all the different time intervals. But even though the carbon dioxide was elevated, the PaO2 levels were not different uh, between the three different groups across any of those time points. 
How about metabolic changes and end organ damage? Lactic acid. Lactic acid was lower in the face mask group when compared to the intubated and the bag valve mask group. Let's look at the creatinine levels, end organ damage. The creatinine levels were also lower in the face mask group when compared to the bag valve mass group at all time points and when compared to the intubated group at about 40 minutes, statistically significant. So we concluded that positive pressure ventilation, whether by endotracheal tube or bag valve mask, does not result in a survival advantage, that there was actually worse thermoregulation and, and hemodynamic compromise. There was worse perfusion of vital organs which we saw by a higher lactic acid levels and a worse increase in creatinine. And this was uh, published, published by uh, Sharvin in the Journal of Trauma Acute Care in uh, July of 2014. So again, I have to ask the question, why is there no change in practice? The lab shows it, our, our retrospective studies out in the field show it. What would it take for there finally to be a change in practice? So we think the PIPT trial, the Philadelphia Immediate Transport in Penetrating Trauma trial. What is it? It's a collaboration of the trauma directors uh, and all the trauma centers in Philadelphia and the Philadelphia EMS. So all of the trauma centers are on board. Temple University Hospital, the trauma center at Penn Presbyterian, Hahnemann University Hospital, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, Albert Einstein Medical Center, all of them are level one trauma centers, and Aria Health Torsdale, which is a level two trauma center. And what we sought to determine with this trial, or what we're looking to determine, is if pre-hospital procedures in penetrating trauma will influence survival. Our design is a prospective randomized trial of only patients within the Philadelphia area, of ALS units only, and patients would be randomized to receive BLS treatment or immediate transport or current ALS transport. The randomization would occur at the EMS dispatcher and, and the patients would be randomized by odd or even on that number as to whether they are randomized to the ALS treatment or to the immediate transport treatment. Our inclusion criteria would be gunshot or stab wounds that are proximal to the elbows or knees, a patient that's in shock with a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 or a heart rate greater than 100 or a change in mental status. Our exclusion criteria would be any injury above the clavicle, a known age less than 18, a pregnant patient, or a prisoner. The BLS care would be a Pennsylvania EMS protocol for traumatic injury, which would be no endotracheal intubation and no intravenous, fluid place, uh, no intravenous placement. The only exception would be for a clinical diagnosis of attention pneumothorax where an ALS intervention of needle decompression could occur. The ALS treatment would be, again, Pennsylvania EMS protocol for traumatic injury including endotracheal intubation where appropriate, and intravenous catheter insertion with fluid administration. There would be no study of the interventions performed in the hospital, just the study of those interventions that took place prior to the patient arriving in the hospital. Consent would be obtained from the patient, if appropriate, or a legally authorized representative for all penetrating trauma patients. And the consent would be obtained by a PIPT research associate or the trauma team member. We would have data accrual at arrival, at 24 hours, and at hospital discharge or 30 days. Our primary endpoint would be survival to discharge. Our secondary endpoints would be 48-hour mortality, hospital and ICU length of stay, transfusion requirements, ventilator days, complications, including discharge disability. Now, of course, you're like thinking, holy cow, how are they going to do this study? There are a lot of challenges. There are regulatory issues, 
There's this exception from informed consent that we need to get, and we'll go over that. There's this conceptual disconnect in that more should be more. How could less be more? And it is exceedingly socially complex. So regulatory issues. We already have the FDA approval. We have the Pennsylvania Medical Advisory Committee approval. We have the Pennsylvania Department of Health approval. We have the City of Philadelphia IRB approval. We have the institutional IRB approval from all of our trauma centers, Temple Penn, Hahnemann, Jeff, Einstein, and Aria. And our waiver of informed consent was granted. So let's talk about exception from informed consent. There are very strict guidelines under federal regulation. It is for emergency research consent only. There are seven very strict requirements to justify an exception from informed consent. And PIPT meets all those requirements and we'll go through them. So patients will be enrolled before they're able to provide consent. And that's why we need this exception from informed consent. You can't very well be trying to get consent on a patient in the field that's hypotensive, tachycardic, and just been shot. This is a type of research that's approved in very rare circumstances by the federal government when the following requirements are met. Patients are facing an emergency, life-threatening illness. Current treatments are not satisfactory or have limited evidence to support their use. Neither the patient nor the family is able to provide consent due to the emergency nature of the illness. Participation in the research holds out the prospect of direct benefit to the subjects. The research cannot be done without the waiver of consent. The patient or family will have a chance to, provi to provide or refuse consent as soon as possible after enrollment that the community has been consulted, and that there be an opt-out plan. So we'll talk a little bit about the community consultation. We need to uh, provide a consultation to the Philadelphia area population, and it's a conversation and an education with the community. It's population-based, looking at the high-risk and high-interest areas around the communities around our trauma centers. We need an opt-out process. Uh, which we've developed as wristbands that would be worn at all times until the study ends. And we would include opt-outs for minors who may be mistaken and enrolled in the study. There needs to be a public disclosure prior to the study beginning. A little bit about the opt-out process. Uh, there would be an opt-out available. It would be this, um, uh, this wristband that you could go online or fill out a paper and you would get this wristband in the mail and you would wear it. And it would indicate refusal of enrollment in the study. We need a public disclosure using the media, broadcast, print media, electronic resources. We have our own website. We are not yet up on Facebook or Twitter, but plan to be. We need institutional-based uh, public disclosures in all of our hospitals flyers and posters notifying people in our trauma clinic and our inpatients. And the conceptual disconnect is real. More does seem to be more, and less doesn't seem to be more. But in this situation, less is indeed more. And we have seen this already in our medical practices. In some scenarios, less intervention actually amounts to more for patients. There are restrictive transfusion thresholds. Less sedation is good for the critically ill patient. There are fewer applications now for invasive hemodynamic monitoring, and there is less intensive glycemic control throughout our hospitals and in our ICUs. It is socially complex. There is no doubt about that, in that research in violent penetrating trauma will disproportionately enroll young, mostly poor, black, and Latino men. But in a study that Dr. Marr presented at EAST and recently published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, that race, socioeconomic status, and proximity to violence do not correlate with attitude toward EFIC or willingness to participate in emergency research. 
in that these patients do have good attitudes, do want to participate, and are willing uh, to participate in emergency research. Currently, right now, we've done about uh, 840 community consultation surveys. We've touched about 5,000 5, individuals. We've already started uh, active community consultations in all of the trauma centers. We've done uh, continuing education to the Philadelphia EMS about the study in 2015 and 2016. Needless to say, the community engagement, education, and collaboration is critical. So what are our next steps? Our next steps are to complete the community consultation, to do training at each of the trauma centers, to have center-specific activities for consultation. When all of that is done, we'll have our review by the Philadelphia IRB and the Penn IRB. And when they give us the approval, then we'll start our patient accrual phase. Uh, preparation for the patient accrual phase will be training at each trauma center, uh, including collaboration for data collection. Our timeline, which uh, seems to uh, get longer and longer as we do more of our community consultation, we began all of this in January 2015, and we will continue the community consultation and the EMS training into the spring of 2017. We'll hope to take our community consultation to the Philadelphia and Penn IRBs in April 2017. Our then public disclosure uh, will continue and that the study will be beginning in April 2017. And then we hope to enroll patients into the study in June 2017. And we think that the study will last about five years. Uh, we are looking for an 8% reduction in mortality and when we do our power analysis, that says a little uh, over 1,000 patients. So in summary, our study is a, a prospective, citywide, randomized study, a partnership with all the trauma centers in the Philadelphia Fire Department. We're looking to uh, enroll and treat a little over 1,000 patients with penetrating trauma and shock. And the trauma surgery community in Philadelphia believes that this study and the findings will show that we can save lives by minimizing the procedures that are done in the field. It's an ongoing collaboration of all the trauma centers uh, and the Philadelphia EMS and the Philadelphia Fire Department is absolutely key to the success of this trial. I'd like to thank the City of Philadelphia trauma directors and also the Philadelphia Fire Department. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Zoe Marr who has really taken on the community consultation uh, and done so much with it. Thanks very much.